And uh, Judy, if you could do the roll call. You got it. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempfling. Yes, here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Also present are village manager Patty Bates, assistant village manager Melissa Dodd, and Chief Brian Carlson. All right, great. So this is always a, a nice thing we get to do every two years, which is uh, swearing in of our newly electeds. And uh, if you were at the Little Art a couple nights ago, you saw that we got sworn in once, and we like to keep on doing it. And uh, with that, I'm going to invite Pam Canine, who's our mayor-elect, uh, to come up. And village solicitor uh, Chris Connard is going to swear uh, soon to be Mayor Canine in. Or actually, she already is, so. <laughs> if you would, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And the state of Ohio. And the state of Ohio. And that I will in all respects. And that I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the charter and ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. Observe the provisions of the charter and ordinances of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of mayor. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of mayor. Let me be the first to congratulate you. All right. Yay. Okay, and uh, Mayor Canine, we're going to have you stay up. And uh, we have uh, some new council members uh, to introduce to everyone. And uh, we're going to have Lisa Krieger, Kevin Stokes, and myself, I think, stand up front and uh, get sworn in. Lisa, Mayor. <laughs> Are you going to do a separate? I would like to do one at a time. Awesome. It's simply because I can. I affirm. I affirm that I will support the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution, and will obey the laws of the United States, and will obey the laws of the United States, and the state of Ohio, and the state of Ohio, and that I will, in all respects, and that I will, in all respects, observe the provisions of the Charter, observe the provisions of the Charter, and the ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, and the ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of and will faithfully discharge <laughs> the duties of the office of council member council member <laughs> <laughs> Observe the provisions of the charter. Well, observe the provisions of the charter. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge the duties of council member. The duties of council. <laughs> <laughs> I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio. And the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects observe the provisions of the charter. Observe the provisions of the charter and ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of council member. The duties of the office of council member. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well done. You all have a sheet to sign, yes. please. Yes. I'll shake it from there. Okay, cool. Oh, and I left mine up here. You can just put your signature there. Okay. And, um, can you both out? Yes. Okay. I will stand aside and I believe we are finished. No need for a lot of things other than to say we're all excited to be here. We are. All right. Yeah, yeah which has been an ongoing issue. Going on. So, yeah, okay. and we'll talk about uh, Spencer is going to fix that. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. Um, all right. Excellent. Uh, we and uh, thanks, folks, for coming to join that. Um, so, next up, uh, we always every two years uh, think about our uh, new president and vice president for council as well as our rules and procedures. So, uh, with that, I will accept any nominations for president of Village Council. Well, I'll nominate Brian for president. Second. Okay. Any other nominations? All right, well, I found out uh, from Robert's rules that if there's one nomination, we can just do it by a simple vote. So all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. All right. Um, next, uh, I'd entertain uh, any nominations for vice president of Village Council. I nominate Marianne McQueen. I'll second that. Any other nominations? Okay, yeah, and I guess I was supposed to have a motion to close the nominations, right? Didn't we do that last time? <laughs> so, so I'll entertain a motion to uh, close the nominations. So moved. Okay, second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> All right, that's uh, <laughs> that was fortuitous. Um, okay, so next up we have uh, uh, announcements. So, do any council members have any announcements? Well, I would like to uh, give a thanks to the Yellow Springs Police Department and the Miami Township Fire Department for hosting a very frigid but very fun and very <laughs> peaceful. Uh, New Year's Eve celebration with, I guess it was hot chocolate, I didn't have any hot there, chocolate, yeah. but anyway, it was a great celebration, very, very cold, but thank you, and please extend our thanks to everyone else that was there. And I do also want to add to that our uh, the rest of our village team who were there to keep everybody safe. Oh, right. I know uh, yeah, we had Johnny Burns and yeah, well, Patty was, was there. there and uh, yeah. I was handing out really... candy canes. That was very popular. And we did not have <laughs> enough of them for everyone who wanted one, so huh. we will do better on that next All year. All right, I I always have a ton for my tree, so I'll, That's why I'll donate right next time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, any other announcements? Um, I have one. I'd like to be certain that everyone's aware of the Martin Luther King Day events. Um, it's really over two days. Um, the first day is January 14th at the First Presbyterian Church from 2 to 4 p.m. There's going to be a teach-in and sign painting session. And then the full program is going to be on Monday, January 15th. That's Martin Luther King's actual birthday. It's going to be a little bit different because the march is going to start at the Bryan Center. Subway. Is that right? Subway. Subway. Oh, at Subway. That's right. At at 11 a.m. And then um, the Yellow Sp uh, Yellow Springs uh, World House Choir is going to sing, and there's going to be poetry readings and essays by students from the local schools and the presentation of the 2018 Community Peacemaker Award. I want to be certain that I got the time right for the start of the march. I yeah, actually, think I it's, did. it's uh, 10 a.m. they'll start gathering. It's the march, and then the program is at 11. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for the clarification. As soon as I said it, I knew I was wrong. <laughs> oh, it's here. here. Yeah. Yeah, here. It starts at the Subway? Starting subway at the subway. It just comes here. Mm -hmm. It just oh. comes here. Are they just coming straight mm -hmm. or going around no, the block? No, it goes I don't around. Know. It goes, um, uh, actually, Bomani sent me a, an email. Um, it will go uh, from subway um, south on Xenia and then right on the limestone up Walnut Street to Dayton and Dayton Street to the Bryan Center. 
So we hope it's warmer. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Lisa, would you say again what's happening on the 14th? On the 14th at the First Presbyterian Church from 2 um, to 4 p.m. there's going to be a teach in and sign painting session. So maybe people are going to be painting signs that they would then um, march with. Right. Or possibly. Yeah, and then I, I think the teach-in is is highlighting all the <laughs> important aspects of the of this holiday mm -hmm. for Yellow Springs and and everyone. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, um, I wanted to add, and and maybe this was on Patty's list too, but we have the tree pickup. Was that one of your announcements? It was not. Thank all you. right. Do you want to give the details on that? Um, so next week, uh, starting Monday, uh, the village will be picking up uh, Christmas trees. So just make sure to have them outside um, starting Monday. And those will be picked up throughout the week? Throughout the week, uh, not necessarily on your regular garbage day. Just put them out and they'll, the crews will make the rounds and pick them up. and. Uh, recycle. They do that with the Boy Scouts, I believe, every year. Okay, yes. And um, I did want to add on, because of Martin Luther King Day, uh, the next council meeting will be on January 16th, so again, we'll have a Tuesday meeting. Um, January 19th, I want to emphasize the reopening of the Bryan Center Community Gallery. And you may have seen posters around. We're going to be celebrating the Banner Festival that uh, we used to uh, see around town. And there will be a uh, artist talk at 7 p.m. And that'll be throughout the building, but uh, we'll have refreshments in rooms A and B. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, just because, uh, you know, since we're just getting started, is that the Economic Sustainability Commission will be meeting tomorrow in this room at 7 p.m. And the HRC will be meeting, right, not canceled, uh, this Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, in this room as well. Um, and, and I did want to encourage uh, you, you know, new council members, uh, if, if you want to attend those meetings, especially to get an idea of what the commissions are doing, those are public meetings, so uh, any and all of us can attend any commission meeting. All right. So with that, uh, any other, oh yeah, Patty, you have some announcements. I do have some announcements. The water plant is online. So, yay! Um, the water plan is online. It's actually been online for a couple of days. We were, um, this is how the EPA wanted it to go to work the glitches out, but the water plan is online. So, if you have a water softener, uh, please, you know, make your adjustments as you see fit. It should be somewhere around 15 grains per gallon, um, but you should check with whomever is your service provider. Uh, so that they can give you a better feel and it might take you a little experimentation um, to figure out exactly where you want that water softener to land but it is online and producing water and I want to give kudos to everyone who has worked on this project from the beginning all of my staff Melissa Johnny Brad's especially and his staff Shook construction uh, it's just been uh, a long road but we are there so um, I also want to thank my crews who have been out in this frigid weather several times over the last couple of weeks, repairing broken water lines, <laughs> clearing sewer back up, putting power back on. Um, it is going to continue with the cold weather that tends to make the ground uh, freeze and thaw and that's where your breaks and your clogs and things come from. So. Um, great job to the crews, and I really appreciate everything that they've been doing. Um, finally, I do want to welcome Spencer Glazer as officially our new station manager. He's behind the camera waving at you right now, so you probably can't see him. You can't be um, But um, Spencer, welcome. And with that, of course, we are saying goodbye to Susan, um, who has been our station manager. Uh, the seventh will be Susan's last day as a village employee, but um, Susan, you have done an incredible job, and it has been a joy to work with you. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to say thank you so much, Susan. You came in at a time where we uh, were in a big pinch, and you've added so much positive energy to uh, community access. Mm -hmm. And I think you wanted to say a few words? All right, well, come on up. To the microphone, please. <laughs> Two and a half 
years and I get to talk at the podium. <laughs> I'm Susan Gartner. For those that don't know me in TV land, I'm the Channel 5 station manager outgoing and I've been doing this job for two and a half years and I'm handing the reins over to Spencer Glazer. Uh, for those that know, it's been a really difficult 2017 and I want you all to know that it's ending on a really high note. I feel really good. I feel really good about what's happening here. I feel very good about what's happening there. It's just a great uh, end of the year, much better than you know the rest of 2017, which was not very good. Um, uh, and I knew that the advances that were happening in the station were going to surpass my skills, so I knew that this was going to happen. Um, but I feel very good about what I did for the station, and I feel very good about where the station is so that I can hand it over to Spencer. Um, I want to say how much I appreciate all the love and hugs that I got this year, especially going through this really difficult time. If you don't think that they mean something, it does mean something. Thank you very much. It was a soft place to be here with all your love and hugs, and I appreciate that. Um, one of the perks of the job that I didn't see coming was that I got a chance to know the Yellow Springs Police Department. And uh, I just think we have such a gang. Oh my gosh. So um, uh, that being said, uh, Chief Carlson and I are coming up with ideas for me to help behind the scenes so that I can still be a volunteer and be in this building. So you'll still see me. Uh, we haven't worked it all out, but he has a lot of ideas and I really appreciate that. I want to make special mention of Judy Kintner and how wonderful it's been to work with you. You have a wonderful sense of humor and that's been a real treat. And you uh, have this thing that I can't say so I have to use another word. Um, horse hockey, a horse hockey detector <laughs> um, that is so finely honed and when I would be um, uh, confused about a debate or something and you just could figure it all out and just nail right to the meat of the problem. And I learned so much that way, but I also learned to appreciate the decision making of, of planning and border zoning and council. And I really appreciate the position that you are all in and how you make your decisions. And I'm speaking to the prior council and the current council. Uh, it is hard to make decisions. It's a, it's a democracy. You don't always win. Um, and the flack that some of you get, I just don't think it's deserved. I think that this is a tough spot and you make really the best decisions for our community and I appreciate that. It's a hard job sometimes and I really appreciate it. Uh, this job is a hybrid of talents housed in one person and I feel very good about what I was able to do with my limitations. Um, I want to thank Patty and uh, Brian for a gift that I don't think you even know you gave me. I had an idea. I wasn't sure I could do it. It was within my limitations of what I could do. And you <coughs> let me do it. You gave me the freedom to see if I could do it. And I did. And that is just a great gift. So two and a half years later, I'm thanking you for that gift of saying to me, we like your idea. Let's see if you can do it. And so that was really nice. I really appreciate that gift. During the holidays, I got the best card ever. I couldn't have scripted this. I can't believe this card. It's from villager Tony Laracuta. I am sending you a special thanks. This is Tony writing to me. I am sending you a special thanks for all the wonderful moments you have captured on film, put to music, and share with our beloved community. I enjoy them so much and think of you with sincere appreciation. You are an artist, historian, and community builder. And that's what I tried to be. So thank you, Tony, for that, because that's what I wanted to be. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Susan. And again, an official welcome to uh, Spencer Glazer. Glad to have you on board. Um, so next up we have the consent agenda and there's just one item which are the December 18th, 2017 minutes. Uh, are there any, anything before I entertain a motion to accept those minutes? 
And Brian, you can adopt, and then everyone can vote, or you can you can you can approve, and then the three of you can vote. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, if there are no comments, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adopt the minutes from December. I'm, I 18th. move that we adopt the minutes. Second. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, uh, so, next we have a review of the agenda. Um, so, are there any uh, changes or additions that anyone has? I have a question of Judy. Did you get anything from Nick Cunningham? No. No, I did not. Would you, do you think it would be better to wait until we do get that? Uh, I mean, I can yes, do because it there, nothing will change in the, in the intervening okay. time. I, I'll nominate is, him as so. the next council meeting. Okay. okay. Uh, anything we, else? Yeah, Judah? Uh, don't we need to add yes. a couple of things? I think so. Um, do you want to? No, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, one thing that uh, we uh, need to add is related to the CBE covenants. Um, and this, this relates to the property uh, that Cresco Labs is developing. <laughs> um, and. I guess I'm going to suggest that we add it to legislation, but the other option is to add it to new business. Um, I'd suggest legislation. Okay. All right. So let's add that to legislation. And uh, is there something else, Judah? Um, I guess it's, I don't know. I, I didn't put it on the table. I just saw there were things on the table. Oh, I, well, I think. It's all related to the other the pieces, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so if there's nothing else, then I think we will move to petitions and communications. And uh, Marianne, are you ready so to I, I cover those? I have a hard copy of what awesome. we received. Uh, so first, uh, I'd like to uh, note that we received a uh, letter from Chris Simga, it's actually a news release, that Tecumseh Land Trust did receive the federal grant that they applied for from the um, NRCS of uh, $1.44 million in federal funding that's going to be matched by various uh, local and regional sources. And this was a competitive national grant process. There were 19 grants awarded. Uh, no, 91. 91. 91. Okay, yeah. When I first read it, I yes. flipped the right. one on the nine. 91 Still pretty impressive. regional conservation partnership projects awarded around the country. Um, but it's really cool. And it's for the uh, two sub headwaters of the scenic Little Miami River, the Jacoby Creek and the Yellow Springs Creek, to do conservation and not reno what do you re renaturalization and protection of those uh, two creek uh, areas. So uh, I know that we will be hearing more about that, and uh, Krista is going to be talking with the Environmental Commission. We're going to speak with her soon, but this is very exciting. It will also uh, involve the land that is uh, part of the property that the Community Solutions Agraria is where that is located too. So that is a very exciting event. And the village had, pl had pledged $200,000 toward is a matching. Right, and, and some of this matching is also in kind. So uh, Antioch College, the Yellow Springs Schools, and others that can uh, provide expertise in this are part of those 12 partners that Mary Ann yeah. mentioned. Well, actually, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Xylem, yep. Central State, Green County, Soil and Water, uh, Ohio EPA, and Clean Ohio Local Agricultural Easement Purchase and Open Space Program. So. Okay, um, another, we had two letters from... Wait, can I ask just a question yeah. on this? Mm -hmm. So the award was $1.44 in federal funding, or is that correct? Yes. And then we put two hundred thousand right. dollars in. Is that a part of that one point four four? Is that no, an No. So they're ma that's, we're, that's a matching. matching. That's matching. So yeah. okay. And so you know, basically, what this allows TLT to do is now solicit, you know, these property owners <laughs> because now we've got a pot of funding, um, so we can you know basically leverage all of that, and we've got five years to spend it. 
So is the is is the matching amount the same amount? One point four four million. Yeah, in so cash and in kind oh, okay. services. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. All right, thank you. So we have two uh, letters from Chief uh, Carlson regarding local citizens who have um, been appreciative of two different police officers. And uh, one of the police officers was Officer Charles for assistance that he gave for a medical uh, issue for a local resident. And the other uh, officer was Officer Bennington. And um, I'm not sure what. She responded to a theft. Um, and the homeowner was uh, very appreciative of how she handled the situation with his family. So not only is it a great that our officers are performing good jobs, but it's also really nice that citizens are coming to the police department and and giving positive feedback. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was at a restaurant in Beaver Creek and one of the people approached me and told me about this. And the last thing that I have here is from Dino, you know, and I never um, knew Dino's last name, I just know. So it's Paolo. Is that how it's pronounced? Or Paolo? Pallotta. 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 Okay. Uh, Dino has been on the Environmental Sustainability Commission. Economic. Eco economics. Yes, I have environment in my head. The Economic Sustainability Commission. And previous to that, he was on community resources, and he was particularly interested in seeing a some business be located on the what we had called the uh, Center for Business and Education property, as well as having utilities extended. So Dino feels that uh, he did work toward that end, and he's appreciative of council uh, management and staff for helping assist that, and he feels like his job is done and he needs to focus on his own business so he's uh, resigning from the economic sustainability commission okay and so i think that means judy we now have a full membership as well as we still have an alternate position that can be filled on the esc okay thank you marianne um okay so we have two pieces of legislation which is we're going to move to next and um judy for resolu resolution 201801 could you read that in by title only indeed <clears throat> this is authorizing the sale during calendar year 2018 of municipally municipally owned personal property which is not needed for public use or which is obsolete or unfit for the use for which it was acquired by internet auction pursuant to ohio revised code section 721.15d Okay. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right. Um, so, Patty, I think this is yours. Sure. Um, every year we have certain pieces of surplus property um, that we have to dispose of, and the way that we do that is either through gov deals or we also want to add this year the possibility of um, muni bids, which are two websites where you can sell surplus government property. In order to do that annually, we have to have council's permission, so we uh, bring a blanket requisition that allows us to dispose of the property for that calendar year. And so muni bids is something we have not used before? We have not. Um, it's, uh, we've always used gov deals, that's what the legislation has said, but we've, we've learned of this new website as well, and um, Ken Metz, who is our property manager and handles the surplus property sales, he checked it out and said he would like to give both of the websites. Um, a try and see what what happens. Do, is there some known difference between the two, or it's just a matter of having? <laughs> it's just a different. Uh, it's just a different uh, website. Does exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so he would like to try them and see what kind of better response we get. Okay. Also, have a question if you don't mind about the uh, fees. It says that you the the max fees that we will pay will be seven and a half percent, but. Uh, would we try to enter into, into some deals where the buyer pays all the fees? Um, it doesn't usually work very well that way. We don't get a whole lot for our surplus property to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, we try to set minimum bids on them, but sometimes we don't even get the minimum bids, so we have to take them down and try and get a lower bid. Okay. So. All right. Yeah. Lisa? Um, not knowing exactly what kind of property 
this is, I'm not sure, but as I read it, I wondered, is any of this property something that we would want to make people in the village aware of um, before it would go out for bid in case there was some way to... Well, we can, we can do it by sealed bid as well, uh -huh. um, but you usually don't get nearly the response or the, the, um, the, the you don't get as much money for it. So um, you, can, you can advertise in the newspaper, that mm -hmm. is another option that we have, um, but it's things like old cruisers that we've, oh, all, we've not only put them through the police department, but then we run them through the, the public works department and usually by the time we get done with them, they're pretty beat up or it could be a surplus snow plow or something like mm -hmm. that. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions or comments from council? Well, I support this. I just wanted to note uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, an omission of one word, I think. Oh. In, in section one, the next to the last uh, line, the second sentence, I think it should say this is in, in addition. addition. So, yes, <laughs> sorry. Add that. that. That's my oversight. Judy, can you fix that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from uh, citizens? Okay. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And then we have our uh, newly uh, introduced piece of legislation, which is Ordinance 2018-01. And I think, Judy, since we are talking about this as an emergency, can we read it in in full? Sure. This is an emergency ordinance amending the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the Center for Business and Education for the purpose of complying with Ohio law. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, the village is the owner of 35.113 acres of property identified by parcel number, very long number, recorded at volume 2544, page 312 at SEC. And whereas the Ohio legislature approved the use of medical marijuana and Ohio laws permitting medical marijuana are in conflict with federal law, as are other laws in an overwhelming majority of states throughout the United States that approved the use of medical marijuana. And whereas the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the Center for Business and Education, the Covenants, permit amendments by the owners of 75% or more of the total acreage of the lots, and whereas the village owns 76% of the total acreage, and the village has determined that the covenants should be amended to be consistent with Ohio law and the village zoning code, and whereas it is council's intent to amend the covenants to comply with Ohio and local law by deleting the word federal in section 3.2F and deleting the words or drug paraphernalia in section 3.2Y, see attached exhibit A to this ordinance, and whereas the exercise of the village's home rule powers to pass emergency legislation is necessary because the village has entered into a contract for the sale of certain property and the property buyer, Cresco Labs, Ohio LLC, Cresco, seeks to close on the sale of the real property on or about January 5th, 2018, having been granted a license under Ohio law to legally cultivate medical marijuana. In addition, the need to complete construction on or before a September 2018 is mandated by state law and Cresco must have site control of the property to begin construction. Now therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby ordains that. <clears throat> section 1, Section 3.2F of the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the Center for Business and Education be amended, amended to delete the word federal. Section 2, Section 3.2Y of the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the Center for Business and Edu Education be amended to delete the words or drug paraphernalia. Section 3, the village manager shall take the necessary steps to record the amendments with the Office of the Green County Recorder. Section 4, this ordinance is hereby declared to be an emergency measure under the village's home rule powers for the reason that Cresco Labs Ohio LLC seeks to close on the sale of a real property on or about January 5, 2018, and amending the covenants to comply with Ohio laws has been determined to be appropriate by council. In addition, the need to complete construction on or before a September 2018 deadline is mandated by Ohio law and Cresco must have site control vested through title to the property for site control. Furthermore, the village will benefit through the economic development by providing increased revenue to the tax base of the village, creating new jobs, and providing additional funding to the school district. All right. Thank you, Judy. Can I have a motion, please? I move. Second. Okay. Uh, Chris? Well, I apologize that this uh, had to come before council on an emergency basis. Last Friday, we received a letter from Cresco's lawyers uh, that was uh, the natural part of the process that goes towards closing the property. And uh, 
council had been aware and certainly staff had been aware and Cresco's uh, and their lawyers had been aware that the covenants existed. Uh, we were aware that we at some point would have to review those to make sure that there were no issues. Um, and we discovered these two, well, since they discovered we were aware that they existed. Um, and so uh, the purpose of this is to facilitate the closing because there were objections lodged by Cresco, which again, we knew what they would do. Um, and uh, this is one step of that process, which is the only step that council needs to take so that we can hopefully um, get to the closing on January 5th. And Chris, do you want to elaborate a little bit on sort of what you're recommending versus option two? Well, okay, in terms of the legislation, um, I think that uh, the council, and I say this council is a body recognizing we've got two new members, uh, was aware that one, everybody knew the covenants existed. Uh, when the village reacquired uh, the property, um, our intention was to respect the spirit of the covenants. The covenants clearly had a process by which they could be amended, um, either by the declarant, which would have been Education Village, or by the village now, uh, because by virtue of the volume of the ownership. And so, council has the option. We can pass it today uh, by uh, emergency legislation, uh, which is authorized by the charter, uh, in with the expectation that closing could occur on January 5th. If not, our other option is that we could do a first reading at January 10th at our retreat and then do a second reading on January 16th. Uh, the effect of that would push back the closing for at least two and a half, perhaps three weeks, um, and that could impact uh, Cresco's ability to begin construction. The road work is already being done, but they don't own the property yet to get on site to really break ground and do whatever it is that they need to do to move forward. Um, the Planning Commission's done the review. Um, the plans and site review work are uh, comply with the spirit of what the Architectural uh, Review Committee uh, requires, and um, getting uh, title to the property is really the critical next step for them in this process. Does anyone, any council member, have a concern about passing this now? No, I don't have any concern. I think it's a... <clears throat> Excuse me, I think these are minor changes. I think we all understand uh, the issues with states making medical marijuana legal in contrast to what the federal government is doing or not doing. Um, and I think everyone who's been awarded licenses are concerned about the tight time frame uh, that the state is levying with respect to the September uh, go date, if you will. So uh, I think it's uh, well worth the little effort that uh, it will take for us to do this. Right. And then I just want to add, you know, because Kevin highlighted the reason why we're taking federal out, which is the difference between the federal government's position on medical marijuana and Ohio's position. Um, but then the second thing is this uh, 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 drug paraphernalia reference, which, Chris, again, that in Ohio, under Ohio law also includes. Yeah, there's, there's an interesting anomaly in Ohio uh, criminal law, which is the uh, possession of marijuana is a minor misdemeanor. But if you have rolling papers or something that you would use to smoke the marijuana, it's actually a fourth degree misdemeanor, which you could be jailed for. Some other paraphernalia is a misdemeanor. Um, and the broad definition of drug paraphernalia includes um, what one would use to cultivate. So you could imagine that the large facility, that 25,000 square foot facility that Cresco's building is drug paraphernalia. Uh, because that's the purpose that they're intending to construct the building, which is just, you know, an absurd result. Um, and so, uh, certainly when these covenants were drafted in 2006, medical marijuana was, a, was not even a, a vision in anybody's eye, I don't think. And uh, the, the drafters of the, the covenants clearly contemplated that over the 30 plus year period that they would exist, that there would be needs, reasons to reevaluate um, what the covenants were intended to, to protect. Um, moving forward, once the property is sold, I, I would add that um, it kind of changes the dynamic of, of how the prop changes that the property would occur because now we have three, there would be three property owners out there. And so that's something we're going to have to address once that property is sold and as things continue to evolve uh, as the village seeks uh, other uh, businesses to come in and utilize that property. But what those will be, I don't know. And I can imagine myself standing in front of council again at some point with further discussions of what we need to do because of uh, how we have to address the covenants. Okay. 
Um, I was just going to say the, um, you know, given that we made this agreement with Cresco, clearly these little changes we're making, there's no substance to it that we, that the village cares about. And I, and so, um, but I also want to just point out this is the kind of situation where emergency legislation uh, is truly an emergency, and and so I think uh, mm -hmm. there's I certainly have no qualms about making an emergency decision. Lisa, did you want to add something? No, I I do think that in in light of the timing factor, it is appropriate to handle it as an emergency. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. So since this is an emergency ordinance, uh, do we have any comments or questions from citizens? Uh, can you come up to the microphone, please? And then uh, we'd like you to state your name, too, for the record. First and foremost, why would you want to What, what is second? your name? Jonathan okay. Woods. Oh, why would you want the second reading in private or at a retreat? I think what Chris said is that we had two options of, of, of approaching it. Either do it as an emergency legislation now or go the longer route, which would delay all of these other subsequent events that need to happen. The, the, the retreat is not a private meeting. It's actually a public meeting also. Oh, okay. So yep. it is in public. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on the first reading, which it would be the first reading at the retreat, um, there is normally not public comment at a first reading unless it's an emergency. So the second reading would then have been at the next council meeting, which is where the public would be invited. So, yeah, it's a little confusing if you're not used to the process. So, and I've actually read this. Um, what was the original purpose of calling, or who called the um, emergency session? It's, it's not an emergency session. It's just called an emergency ordinance in order to okay. have it passed more quickly so that they can own the property and break ground. Yeah, normally an ordinance will go into effect in 30 days. Um, so in this case, if we pass it as an emergency ordinance, it will go in effect uh, immediately. Uh, and this will allow for Cresco to continue uh, building out their facility. What would go into effect? Uh, the changes in the covenants to allow for a medical marijuana facility, which conforms with Ohio law. As it stands now, what is it? Empty ground. There is nothing there yet. They want to buy the property and build. I would encourage a no vote today. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and I did want to officially say that you know, this is opening the public hearing. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. If not, I'll bring it back to council table. And Judy, would you uh, call the roll? Yes. Hempfling. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Housh. Yes. Okay. Um, so at this point in the meeting, uh, uh, we are at citizen concerns. Uh, we invite anyone to uh, make comments about things that are not on the agenda. And we ask that you limit your comments to three <laughs> minutes. Uh, so do we have any citizen concerns? Jim Hammond. I am Jim Hammond with the Mills Park Hotel. Um, I have a few concerns uh, involving compliance with the new lodging tax that just went into effect yesterday. Um, the, the first thing, records and inspections. Uh, the ordinance states uh, the right of the finance director or his or her agent to inspect, audit, make copies of books, records of the lodging establishment, including registration forms. Uh, Guest information is personal and confidential, and according to the Ohio uh, Hotel and Lodging Association, hotels have a duty to protect this information. Although Yellow Springs government is a public entity with, with a history of dishonesty and animosity towards the hotel by certain village officials, I cannot in good conscience release this information, or uh, business records for that matter. Uh, my second concern is under the auditing procedures. It uh, states the finance director shall have the right to order a special purpose audit paid for by the operator. An audit 
uh, would be very expensive for a business of our size. Uh, we feel an audit ordered by the village should be paid for by the village. And my third is under the exemptions. Um, the third uh, exemption here says rents received by individuals renting a room or rooms for fewer than five nights per calendar year are uh, exempted from the tax. By definition, an individual is not the operator or proprietor, so they must be the renter. Uh, we don't know in advance how many days a guest is going to rent rooms, so we really don't know how to proceed. Um, I guess we'll start charging tax after the fourth, after the fifth day. I think in that case, individual refers to the owner, not the person renting the room. Well, if you, if you refer to the um, definitions stated in the ordinance, it's proprietor or operator is the, the one collecting the tax. So the way the law is written, um, we're a little confused on how to proceed. Okay. Chris, do Thank you, you want Jim. to address that? Or? I, I, I haven't looked at it. I don't have that um, in front of you, but I, I can tell you Melissa. Mm -hmm. Jim. We can respond. And have you talked to the village manager or our finance director about your concerns? Um, no, I have not. The, uh, the impact of this ordinance on the local businesses was never considered by the council. They just, the ordinance was passed, no one came and talked to us, asked us any questions on how this would affect our business, so hence my concerns. Well, I, I would, I mean, I assume you are willing to, yeah, I, I, I would mm -hmm. like it if you would meet with that has generally been Melissa's project, Melissa, but and go over your concerns and, I, and just a minute. And I would like to find out the result of that conversation mm -hmm. and if that. If I remember correctly, a couple of years ago, the village council president asked the village manager to go visit the the two at that time businesses that would be affected by this ordinance to see what the impact would be, and it never happened. I don't remember ever having been asked oh. to do that. It, it's in the minutes. I don't know. So are you willing to do that, Jim? Yes, To meet with Melissa? Okay. Thanks. Um, and Melissa, did you say you had some comments at this point? Or? I don't know. I just, Chris and I said that we would work for okay. a response because some of it's just interpretation of language and such. So we, I don't have it in front of me either. So I'd like to be able to look at it directly. So I'd like to address the first two parts, which has to do with the records and with the audit costs. Um, first, on the records piece, um, the types of records, we're not talking about the identity of individuals, it's simply how many people were there at a given time. So there would not be a request to disclose personal information regarding any guest. Um, the second part would be on the audit costs. An audit would only be done in extreme circumstances where there was some evidence that there was a failure to comply with the, the reporting. So the, the fact that there would be an audit would so, be so far down the, the stream of the discussion that was going on with an operator in the village, um, I think that the, uh, an audit would be very unlikely. Um, it would only occur in the most rare circumstances where every means of some dispute resolution had been virtually exhausted. Uh, and I suspect it would only happen with somebody who was uh, very resistant to cooperating with the village. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, I mean, I do want to say that, uh, you know, I'd like to go overboard with clarifying any language. So if we need to distinguish what information we're not talking about um, collecting, uh, it, it, to Jim's first point, I think that's great. Um, but I do want to say, Jim, before you uh, uh, comment again, that I do want to take issue with uh, the idea that the village did not meet and understand the impact. Uh, I know you and I met several times. I know that you met with Judith. Um, I'm guessing you've talked to other council members as well. Um, and I was at a meeting that involved uh, Patty Bates and, and Johnny Burns and Jason Hamby as well. So, I mean, I do want to clarify that I feel that there were lots of conversations as well as uh, this topic being discussed in at least six meetings. Well, that had to do with the, uh, with the, the tax in general. Okay. I'm referring to the ordinance. Okay. That all happened way before this ordinance was written. So I'm concerned, I'm talking about the actual wording of the ordinance and to respond um, about the type of uh, uh, records. 
it does say registration forms specifically. And registration forms are going to have the customer's name, credit card information, dates that they stayed, and that kind of thing. So okay. it's, it's just it's written there. I have to you know, comply sure. with what's written. That's my Good. concern. Well, Thank you. I feel the intent is to be as least onerous as possible. And so if there are things in the ordinance that are going to be too difficult for uh, the hotel or any other business, I, I really encourage, I would like them to be changed so it's as simple as possible. Sure. And, and we don't even, I'm sorry, we don't even have to feel that way because uh, Melissa's put that in writing, mm -hmm. that that is the intent. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Judith. I was just going to say, um, my understanding was we looked at other uh, local ordinances and we base this on those so this is not something we just came up with on our own and you know looking at a couple other places you know as examples I think we should go with that and not make this more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. Did you have a comment sir? Uh, if you could come up. Jonathan Woods. Um, first, I'd like to know who chose your wording for the license, $25 fee. You know, one thing I'd like to say is when people make comments, they should bring all their comments at one point and then we respond and not just, sure. just several questions. That might be out of order. Yeah, so, uh, so as Judith said, uh, it, we can take all your questions and then answer those. Okay. I've already stated my question. Okay. So. Well, can, I, can I, you, could you repeat, I'm yeah. sorry, I just didn't catch it. Who chose the wording for the license? The, for the license itself, you mean how was it written on the form? The $25. Yeah, there's, there's a $25 fee to file to get the permit um, to be um, a bed and breakfast or have uh, someone from out, outside staying. The wording was, uh, did you write that particular one? No, Denise did. De Denise, our planning and zoning officer with the help of our uh, solicitor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other citizen concerns? Okay. What's your last name? Denise who? Swinger. Swinger. Okay, so um, I believe we have no special reports, so that brings us to old business. And the first thing on old business is the um, uh, follow-up on the uh, revisions of the taser policy. And so, Judith, is that going to be you? Yeah, that's going to be me. Okay. Because really, this is only coming back to council because you know we've talked about this before. Um, it's only coming back to council to. Uh, be put into legislation. Um, the, you know, we went over this some months back uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, it's been probably at least eight months ago mm -hmm. when the recommendation was made from the Justice System Task Force to change the Taser policy, <laughs> and Council was generally in agreement with uh, the change. Uh, what the change involves, I'll just go over it very briefly. Um, was, rec you know, the recognition that tasers, um, you know, there are days dangerous to be to associated with using tasers, and um, so, you know, we're suggesting that uh, they be limited um, with vulnerable populations and in terms of um, being used in compliance in circumstances where there's not a danger to self or others. Um, as Ellis's uh, report said from November, uh, the modifications to the guidelines are derived from several sources. Two important ones are the national consensus policy on the use of force. Uh, this consensus policy on use of force is a collaborative effort among 11 of the most significant law enforcement leadership and labor organizations in the United States. It's funded by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. The second major source was the American Civil Liberties Union research and case law regarding the use of tasers. Um, after these recommendations were made to council, uh, Ellis and I sat down with Chief and I think one of the sergeants as well and uh, went over it. Uh, Chief indicated his comfort with it. And so the question then was, you know, how do we, you know, how do we make this 
the <coughs> policy of the village, you know, the policy of our police department. And in this case, the village council is, um, you know, is playing a role here in terms of that policy. So, um, so, and I understand, uh, Brian, you had some, you had looked in a little <coughs> more detail. I don't know if you want to bring that up now or, but yeah. we just wanted to get it into a legislative. Yeah, I think maybe we'll, you know, invite Chris to talk about, you know, how we uh, formalize this. But um, for me, and I mentioned this a while back, I did kind of do a careful look at just some of the editorial things. I mean, there, there are a few things that are confusing. I mean, for example, 11B that kind of reads holding themselves hostage with martial arts practitioners. So I, I think there are a few just wordsmithing things that when we finally fix it, we should explain those, maybe change karate sticks to something more like martial arts implements or whatever. So, but beyond that, I think the, uh, the, um, the purpose and concept of protecting citizens and guidelines here has, has been captured. Um, and so I, I'm happy that uh, Chief Carlson agrees with that. And um, if we are ready then to bring that as legislation, I'll make sure those edits get to uh, the chief so, Chris, do you want to maybe tell us how we can move forward with this? <coughs> well, I think we've got two ways. Um, I think we have discussed the idea that uh, council wants to make clear that the policy cannot be amended unilaterally by uh, a subsequent chief or by the manager. In other words, council wants the opportunity to weigh in on any of those changes and be part of a broader public discussion. So based upon that assumption, um, given the import of how council as the public body views the importance of the taser policy, I, I think a resolution would be the way that to be in the minutes to reflect what you intend, and then we should put a placeholder within the policy that says that this policy cannot be amended without approval of council. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Chris, you and I also talked about one possibility of, um, because we're assuming that there may be other policies as we go on that council also um, may not want changed. Um, without input and so we discussed the possibility of adding a resolution sheet to the general orders that listed each of those that said these are the policies that may not be changed without input for, from council and to have that be a like a part the, of the, the preface one resolution right. to address the entire subject of police policy that council would say that it wants input on well, for this for this discussion, are we just talking police-related policy or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, I think the feeling is that we've had this discussion, and why would we hold back on mm -hmm. setting the policy? Mm -hmm. And if we if there's some simple way to then add additional things to the to some well overarching uh, resolution, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you necessarily <laughs> need any action of of council per se. I mean, you could simply insert it into the handbook. But I think the taser policy was part of a larger discussion of uh, concerns about the, the, the review of police department practices um, in a broader sense. So I think that the resolution is the best way to reflect the will of council in this context. And just so I understand, so you're also suggesting that the police might have in their policy book resolutions that council has passed vis-a-vis -vis policies that council doesn't want changed without that's certainly one way to do it. I mean, that I, seems like. Yeah. I think the the easiest way to do it would be to add like a number 15 that says, this policy may not be changed without approval of council, and then put resolution 2018 dash whatever in parentheses. So that would be in the general operations that, manual. That would be in this policy. Okay, and then if we could also add that to the resolutions, because I'm thinking as we pass these resolutions, that could be part of the, you know, whereas. Mm -hmm. I mean, this may be a statement of the obvious, but mm -hmm. the, the, I want the minutes to reflect this. The reason why we want to do that is, is that councils change, police chief change, yes, managers absolutely. changes. So yes. we want this mm -hmm. legacy to be in place and people to, to know why it's there. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So, I mean, I, so that I'm clear, are we bringing a resolution on this particular policy to the next Yes. yes. Okay, yes. and you're writing in that? We'll, we'll. <coughs> and I'll make sure those, you know, sort of clarification edits get into that final piece. 
Lisa. I, I want to acknowledge the work that has gone into this and the history of this discussion. And I think it's, uh, you know, these are really strong changes. As I read it, the one thing that really stuck out for me is the extent to which <coughs> this being an effective policy depends on training, mm -hmm. particularly as I read about um, how I thought about how would the um, determination of mental health crisis be made in the field. You know, there's these areas that could be really gray, and we know from some of the things that have happened in our country in the past couple of <laughs> years that that could be really open to determination. I don't know how to handle that, particularly in writing, but it seems like the, the training aspect and clarifying those kind of terms in terms of mental health is a critical consideration. Why, and uh, two things that that makes me think of. One is underscoring the fact that we do now require 40 hours of crisis intervention team training for all our officers. That obviously is going to make a difference. And uh, the second thing is our, um, our uh, community outreach specialist. I mean, I think that's an excellent kind of thing for that person to work with uh, the uh, team on. So mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. There is one uh, typo, I think, in the policy statement on uh, the second page, eight, number eight. The first word, I think, probably should be any mm -hmm. person rather than all person. Yeah. And no hyphen. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? I was going to say, in the resolution, I think a... Um, uh, in the language of the resolution, the focus on training, I think, should be part of that. Hmm. Sounds good. Um, any questions or comments from citizens? Okay. Um, all right, so the next topic, I believe, is, is one that I am introducing. And um, one of the things that we also do every two years is look at council rules and procedures. And uh, so Judy has placed in the packet uh, what our rules and procedures currently look like. Um, I guess one thing I will mention is we do not have to make a final decision about this tonight. In fact, um, two years ago, uh, they were finally approved in the first meeting in February. So my suggestion is that we have a brief discussion and then we finalize any changes at our second meeting uh, this month on the 16th. So with that, um, does anyone have any comments or thoughts about uh, our rules and procedures? Um, uh, on Exhibit A, I guess the fourth paragraph where there's some items. Not number two, it says matters required to be kept confidential by federal law, federal rules, or state statutes. This is, this is a, a reason for having an executive session. I think it would be good to spell out what those are so that, uh, so that we all are clear about. I'm lost as to where you're at. Yeah. Are you the second page here? Okay, thank you. In other words, it's saying what the basis of executive session, what the bases can be. There are three different things. And, it, it's so, I mean, real estate, I guess, would be one of the things. But, but it's, it's listed under the executive session criteria. Pardon? It, it, on, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jane. You mean where, where it lists it, real estate personnel? Yeah, if you go, I don't know what page you're on because I'm lost, but if you, if you go to the okay. next page, it says executive sessions may be called, and then it lists out right. what the criteria are for those. Uh-huh. Okay, so the, so that's what that number two is talking about. Okay. It, um, with that being said, um, one thing that I think would be good to have in our next packet is oh, those gotcha. attachments so that we can see all of those and just see what they outline. Mm -hmm. What attachments? Well, for example, what you're talking about is oh. attachment four oh. that oh. enumerates those. Uh -huh. Yeah. So then that way we can all make sure, you know, what, what's covered and, and have that somewhere that people can find. Um, any other? Um, I, I guess when we're having our retreat, maybe this might be a time to talk about, we have the order of business that's uh, explained. Um, 
And, you know, there have been times when we've decided it would be better to bring something up sooner in a meeting. And so I, I think that, one, we have a retreat. I think it would be good to talk about that when we want to look for those kind of things, either because they're citizens that we don't want to have sitting here or some staff people or whatever. Okay. Are, and are you saying <coughs> to discuss changing that permanently? That's, no, that's not your, necessarily. I, because per, any, perhaps, but not necessarily. I mean, anything can be changed when you do that agenda, review. that review of the agenda. Mm -hmm. That's your prerogative. This is just when yeah. an agenda is created, that is the order of business. And then you have the, the prerogative to change it at the time of the meeting as you see fit. And that, so. is, that is articulated somewhere in this that we can change the agenda. Well, it's set right after it lists all those 17 things right. as council may decide during agenda review to vary from this order. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We do have to add the chief's report. But I, I think a lot of times we don't think of that until like it's 10 o'clock, like, oh Ooh. God, we should have done this earlier. Right. Well, I mean, that kind of relates to uh, a comment that I have. So um, I heard, uh, Patty say adding the chief's report uh, to that list since that's become a, a fixture. Um, but I would like to recommend that we change the statement under meetings of striving to end at 10 to striving to end at 9.30. Um, and, and we can talk about this more on the 10th, but uh, I feel strongly that we should limit our meetings to two and a half hours and do whatever we can um, to make that happen. So what that might uh, suggest with our rules and procedures is that we highlight a few other things along the lines of what I think Mary Ann is saying, such as we generally have a three minute time limit for citizen comment, but if we have a packed room and everyone's coming to speak on one issue, we I think should have the latitude to maybe change that to two minutes. Um, I think we should also potentially indicate that if a discussion is going on for a lot longer than we had anticipated to let people know that we might continue those discussions. So those were, I guess, a few things. I don't have all the language, but I thought we should uh, try to highlight more that we're going to basically keep on schedule with our agenda. Um, and that can also help with you know, guest speakers and other folks that want to speak on issues. So, um, so anyway, so that's my main recommendation for how we might tweak this. I mean, if we've got 20 people here who want to speak about something that there you know, is an important issue in the village, so how are you recommending if you gave it 30 minutes? Right. I mean, I think at that point, we, you know, well, well, so first of all, you know, recognizing, you know, what people are here to, to talk about. And I think being fairly committed to, we allocated 30 minutes. Um, so we're going to try to get as many comments as we can, but, you know, uh, letting people know that they will have a chance to speak. So if we can't accomplish it at that meeting, that we do at a future meeting, or we take something off the agenda. I was going to say, Robert's Rules uh, allows us to extend, um, I think, if, if we're more cognizant of our time limits, but um, I don't think that we can set that in stone. Sure. I think, you know, clearly, um, if, it, if there's a strong sense that citizens are, need to have a longer discussion, we feel like there should be a longer discussion, um, we can extend the time, but rather than just letting it go in ad infinitum, you know what I mean, sure. uh, without any really looking at this, the, the schedule or the time frames. Um, and then if it's going to be longer, yeah, looking to take something off if, if that's a possibility. Right. I don't think we're always going to stay in within two and a half hours, on, but I think uh, having yeah. that kind of... I mean, I, and I think you're right. I mean, I think we still leave the language that we strive mm -hmm. to do that. Um, with the other understanding, I saw Lisa nodding that, uh, you know, everyone after two and a half hours starts to lose focus, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think there's that piece as well, just making sure that people um, are able to participate because they can be here. Right. I agree. Yes. Uh, that's the point that I really um, think is so important. You know, having been coming to meetings 
as an attendee. I think it's so important that we try to promote uh, members of the community to participate. And I think part of that is having the meetings be um, a, an amount of time that people might be interested in committing to, that high school students might want to come and commit to. And also, if there's an agenda item and we say, it, you're going to be on the docket at this time, that it, it is that time and not like 45 minutes later. So I think that's, asked, that's an important thing that we need to figure out how to do. And I, I, I support the idea of discussing it more in retreat. Great. I would like uh, a little more in the, in the uh, rules about what constitutes emergency legislation. Um, mm -hmm. what the perp I think it's worth us being more conscious of what is the purpose of two readings and the 30-day extension with uh, regular ordinances, just that we're conscious of the rationales for those things. The only other thing I had a note on is wherever we reference um, that we're, uh, I guess, putting <laughs> things on the website, I also want to uh, put the Facebook page as well. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure, I mean, one of the things I'd like us to regularize, and I think, uh, you know, Spencer, for example, I talked to him before the meeting about whenever he processes the uh, YouTube video, that we get that right on Facebook as well. Yeah. So it's on the website, it's on Facebook, people have that variety of access. And there are some other things as well that we've referenced before, but I think that could be integrated into the rules and procedures more specifically. Um, you know, maybe also making sure that when that draft agenda is ready, that that's put out there. And I think Judy does a good job of that on the website. So again, we could put that on the Facebook page. Okay. Um, so I guess I'm going to recommend, uh, like I said, that we do these tweaks. Um, I'm happy to add some of the ideas that I've heard, and then maybe we can have a new draft on the 10th to review as part of our retreat, and then bring that back to the, the meeting on the 16th. Okay, great. Uh, any questions or comments from citizens? Okay. All right, so our next topic is, um, well, we titled it ethics, but I think what, what we're really looking at is um, potential conflicts of interest, um, at least in perception, related to our boards and commissions. And um, Judith, I'll let you kind of lead off with uh, what you wrote, and then we can go from there. Well, and actually there's two issues, and I see you included a letter uh, that a JSTF That's letter, true. Yeah, uh, I did put a letter on the table. Um, so I'll just speak to both of them briefly. So um, the issue, you know, the issue that uh, occurred with the Justice System Task Force, um, where there was a conflict, where there was also a family relationship, uh, which I was involved with, um, a few people and. Uh, had talked to me about the idea that, you know, there's a problem here and it uh, maybe there shouldn't be family members who are uh, family members of, of liaisons of council because it, it can be complicated by the fact that you've got two different kinds of uh, roles you're trying to play. You're playing a role as a liaison of council and you're also uh, a close friend or family member um, of an, another member. And so when these kind of complicated or difficult issues come up, it's hard to play both roles in a, in a good way or in a useful way. So, um, so it made sense to me initially, but then I started thinking about it and, um, and I sort of became aware of the close friendships that are on our commissions of council members and, um, and it started to look to me like we would, we would potentially be losing uh, good candidates for our commission's work if we, if we restricted uh, all these people from not being able to, to work on commissions where the council member was the liaison. Um, so, um, and I talked to a couple of people about it and one person immediately said in a small town that just isn't going to work very well. Um, so they were, they had a very clear uh, view that, that setting that kind of restriction was not a good idea. Um, and, but the situation 
that occurred at JSTF did raise a, a problem, and so how do we address that problem if we don't just make this hard, hardened restriction? And then I was sort of like, well, where do you, where do you, uh, where do you uh, draw your line? So okay, now you got a really close friend, and sometimes friendships, you know, actually could be more complicated if there was a disagreement, a significant disagreement occurred than a family member, because a family member, they're going to be your family member no matter what, but a friend might not be, you know. So I could see where this could, so I was sort of like, well, so where are we drawing that line? And, um, and I, don't, I think just making it about family members, you know, did not make sense to me given how we think of family here in the village, and a lot of times our families are not just our, rela our people related by blood. So. Um, I did talk to Chris Conard as I wrote. Uh, there is no legal restriction. It is not a legal conflict. Uh, we're not talking about a conflict of interest where somebody's making money uh, out of a, a, a decision. You know, JSTF. It's those that this that discussion did not have anything to do with somebody uh, having some personal gain from it, um, and that would be a different kind of thing. But uh, so what occurred to me is that. Um, you know, recusing yourself or asking the backup liaison to step in if there was a complication like that that occurred was a thing that we actually do frequently, you, you know, as members of council. We could run into these same kind of circumstances as co just plain council members, not as liaisons of committee member as co of committees. So, um, so there's so there's that, and I wanted to, I thought we should have a conversation about it here at the council table because retreat at the retreat there's just not going to be as many eyes on the conversation. I think this is an area where people have opinions and interest, and it's you know that sort of thing. Sorry, I'm not looking towards you guys. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not excluding. Okay, I'm not used to being in the middle. Anymore, so it's that's funny down here. It is. <laughs> okay. The other issue is okay. So somebody um, in that circumstance of you know a commission, a task force member did an action which people felt was inappropriate, was a personal attack, and then there was a letter written by another member of the committee, uh, which also. Uh, of resignation, but made what I would really deem personal attacks in it. And so then the question was, so how are we handling these situations? I wasn't sure the public tasking by several council members of that individual was the most, I'm not sure if that's the effective way to handle a situation like this. Um, if you want that person to be able to take in, you know, maybe I made a poor decision being uh, corrected publicly in two meetings at length, you know, you wonder how effective that really is uh, at helping a person to kind of think through their actions. So that's another question. And then we got this letter, uh, which has personal attacks in it, and how are we handling that? And if we're going to have, if we are going to address those issues in some cons way, we need to do it in a consistent way. So that was, so that's another question. I don't know that we're going to answer these all these questions tonight, but. Uh, I thought if we're going to be talking about what commissions we're going to become li liaisons to, it was something we need to figure out first. Mm -hmm. I will stop there. Well, um, you know, for on our commissions, there are recommendations. For example, it's recommended that the council liaison not serve as the chair unless there's a compelling reason to do so. Uh, there's another recommendation that uh, we only have people from Yellow Springs be on our commissions unless there's a compelling reason. So I, I sort of see the first issue that you brought up as falling in that category. No, knowing that if, and to me it's more about people who are living together family as opposed to people who aren't living together but uh, at any rate I think that whenever we're putting people on a commission that there should be something about you know we, we discourage family members uh, and I wasn't actually looking at it as a council liaison I was looking at it as commission members who were both a member of the same family but at any rate I'm just suggesting that we might have language that says we discourage uh, two member, two or more members of the same family being on a commission um, unless there's a compelling reason, and and then some language about 
if there are some issues that arise, we encourage whatever, one person to recuse themselves or whatever. And the two things that I think come up, can come up in this regard is one, two family members, one family member is being attacked or something, the other family member feels a need to defend their family. That's natural. So that's a conflict that not, has nothing to do with money or anything, but it can be a conflict. The other uh, thing that I think can happen when two members of the same family are on a commission is they actually have a stronger vote or can than just two people because they're, they're, they have the chance to sort of build their agenda together. And I don't, and I don't necessarily, and that could not, they, in other words, have more power than just two people. So those are the two things that I feel. The second thing that you brought up about how commission members and how they re relate to commission members, both the first instance with the Facebook thing and then the second letter are things that I think we need to be much stronger with our commission members. I mean, I think that we have to orient them and have mm -hmm. more in-depth conversations when we get someone on a commission to talk about what what the expectations are, and, and I do think it's appropriate for us to be talking about that on retreat mm -hmm. and not spend an hour or so right now, actually. Mm -hmm. But what about close friends? To, uh, to me, that seems, I don't see that as an issue. Because, you know, if you're not a close friend when you get on a commission, then you might become a close friend when you, when you are on a commission. So, to me, it's more about people who live together. Mm -hmm. But in that instance, actually. Yeah. I think there's, you know, it's, it's complicated because, um, to your point, is if, um, even if, if two people who are related are, are, are truly able to keep the business of the commission separate, um, the, percep the perception goes against that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for anyone to think that, that a person could be completely neutral towards the action of a loved one. And I think because of that, I, I would support the idea that there should be language that says it's discouraged to have the prime, primary liaison be a family member unless there's a compelling reason. There's always could be a reason why but I think it would protect the um, strength of the actions of, of both the liaison and the member of the commission. You know, I think this is a very complicated issue and I think um, we should be careful of even making the presumption that the family familial relationship really had any impact mm -hmm. on the action one way or the other. I mean, it's not a given that, that there's some follow on uh, or that being related to someone, it can happen, gives you license to do something. But I think it's presumptuous unless there's some uh, compelling evidence to that end. Well, I appreciate Marianne's comment about um, orientating our commission members. And, um, and, and I expect that we will have uh, uh, more of a discussion on the 10th about that. Um, I, I will say that, you know, to me, two things that are pretty clear that council has been focusing on is being civil and being constructive. And um, I know one of the things that, that we're going to work on are those uh, elected official value statements and, and try to be more specific about those kinds of behaviors and not have a hundred of them listed. Uh, so, so I think that is something to consider here. and. Um, yeah, I appreciate Judith's comment about sort of relationships and how do we think about that in a more broad way. I, I'm not sure how we best articulate it, um, but, I, but I think having this discussion is a good start. Um, and then I, I know, Judith, you had talked to me uh, about how, how soon can we start to sort of, I guess, get this message to our commissions, um, you know, to let them know that the council's thinking about this and, and wants to make sure that we're being productive and constructive uh, you know, in the work that everybody's doing. So, um, 
So I don't know, because you, you had mentioned you've got the, the task force meeting on Tuesday uh, and potentially um, thinking about responding to this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. Um, just to say, uh, in terms of family, you know, I, I know we're not going to complete this discussion, but family members defending family members, friends defend friends. It's really not a different issue. I don't really think it's that easy to separate out. In fact, that is what happened. Uh, people defended, you know, the person they felt was attacked. And it was a pretty strong defense and isolated the person, uh, you know, who did the action, uh, which, and and then after that, there was another personal attack that took place, and nothing has been done about that. And I'm not talking about, you know, the explaining to people. Personal attacks are never a good thing. They're always, they're always a destructive thing. But I'm asking, so what's counsel's reaction? Now that there was a second personal attack, there's been very little reaction to it. Nothing like what happened with the, what was deemed as a, that first deemed personal attack. They were both done in a public venue. Um, and so if we're going to have that kind of reaction to the first one, I would like to see, I think it's important for the task force that there be a, an official response to the second one as well. Right, and, and no, has, I mean, I've seen this cover letter and you have. It went to the committee. Okay, it have, have any task. other council members seen I, this yet? No. Okay. But um, it, it's, um, it's a situation where it went to the task force and the task force, of course, they are all trying to be working together and uh, this kind of came in and uh, I, I think it's important that we be con that we um, show you know consistency about this and this was truly a personal attack if you thought the other one was this was very personal and um, I think it needs to be responded to uh, how do you think, think it needs to be I think I think uh, our president needs to write a letter saying this is I think an apology needs to be asked for, just as in the first instance. I think we need to be consistent, that's all. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're young or older or uh, whether a mistake was made the first time doesn't make the second thing right. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to say, you know, we don't expect these things to be occurring and it needs to have some consequence uh, if we're going to expect it to stop. I, I don't disagree with you, and I, and I appreciate, Brian, your point that um, in a way, as, as liaisons to these commissions, we become um, me mediators, and it's our responsibility to set a standard and expectation uh, for tone for civility and, and to coach that. And I think it would be, I mean, I, I I think we should talk about it more. What's you know, if if people are consistently behaving in an uncivil way, and and you know if that becomes starts to become the culture, then what do we do about the attendee, you know, the constituency of that that commission? I mean, I um, having worked as a, a mediator, I, I always have this little acronym for the word think. Right? T is it true? H is it helpful? I, is it inspiring, N, is it necessary, and K, is it kind? And if that becomes the culture of a work group, you know, I think you start to avoid these kind of uh, personal attacks, but it seems like this particular commission is in a, in a bad spiral right now. I mean, I think the commission actually is, in a, is, is doing well. There are two incidents that occurred. I don't want to make it sound like it's the whole commission. The commission is actually kind of really getting on its feet. And I think, uh, you know, getting some work done. And mm -hmm. It always at the beginning is hard to mm -hmm. get a new commission up and going, and it's up and going now. But I think, you know, a mistake was made and it was acknowledged and, you know, and then another mistake has been made and that also needs to be dealt with because of the way, you know, that second letter um, uh, I think you know the committee needs to know all this isn't okay either. <laughs> I just think it's a, I think it's a consistency issue, mm -hmm. and it's saying you know one wrong doesn't make the other wrong right somehow. Have there been two resignations? No, just one. Just one. It's just that letter. I see. So those are, that's it. So that's all I was asking to come out of tonight's meeting because we're meeting next Tuesday. And I think that needs to be somehow, you know, a letter 
communicating that should come to our commission, to our task force. Well, I guess I'm going to step out a little bit. I mean, I'm looking at Cindy's letter. Um, one thing, I think there are some differences between the two things. Um, one thing is that the first instance went public on Facebook. That's, that's quite different, I think, than writing a letter to the commission. Now, given still, as you, Judith, as you've noted, once a letter has been written to the commission, it is a public document. But still, I think it's different than Facebook. Secondly, as you read through the letter, well, like using the word unprofessional, self-serving, self-serving is, I mean, there, there are um, opinions. There are opi half-hearted apology, that's an opinion. Um, I, I don't know. I think this is the second thing is a more difficult thing to sort of unpack than the first thing. It's not quite so flagrant. So I don't know. I mean, maybe you can, Brian, you can. And, and I don't know that. I don't know that writing a letter to the letter writer is going to make any difference. I think the difference. I don't think that that's going to make a difference. Maybe saying something to the commission. Um, I was just looking at my calendar. Uh, well, I guess my thought is I, I do want to address it, um, but I'm hesitant to articulate all of this by Tuesday before we've had an opportunity to discuss it more. However, um, I, I wonder if my coming to the meeting on Tuesday and highlighting some of this discussion, um, if that would work for next week, and then we have our, uh, you know, uh, retreat to talk about this further on, on Wednesday. Um, but, but I am comfortable with ultimately putting something in writing that, that we talk more about. Okay. I guess um, maybe it's part of our training. Uh, training, I'll say training, is to have very specific examples of how people can be um, disagree and be critical of someone else's idea or someone else's action in a way that is not, not personally attacking people. Because most people, most of us don't know how to do it, frankly. Mm -hmm. Differentiating between policy dis dis yeah. differences versus what is a personal. You know, like yes. saying that this is unprofessional and well, self-serving. There's other stuff there, Marianne, but I don't know if we need to get into all yeah. of that tonight, yeah, but I, I just think there's other problematical But anyway, why don't we just move on? Okay. Unless there's other things. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate, Judith, that you brought this up, and um, so I, I'm committed to coming to the meeting on Tuesday, and it sounds like there is consensus uh, in sort of the civility and constructive piece, um, but I guess I, I would like to have a chance for us to look at a draft letter that I put together together before um, we send that out. Okay. Um, so we have one more piece of old business, and uh, Chris, I believe you're going to give us an update on House Bill 49. If, if I need to, I mean, I put a report in there because I can summarize it, but I have any questions you want to summarize that report. Maybe just a, a minute overview. Let's see if I can talk as fast as Judy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the sum and substance of this is, is that at our last council meeting, I discussed the litigation that had uh, been filed by <coughs> Uh, not only a group of a uh, coalition of, of cities, but also Rita, um, who manages our uh, tax collection program. Um, and subsequently, uh, a stay of the implementation of the part of the law that the cities are objecting to uh, has been entered in the Franklin County Court, which delays our need to pass the legislation to comply with the state law. So if you recall, there were two parts to this. The first was just housekeeping cleanup items. That's going to still come before council. You'll see that. Um, and we can do it by emergency legislation. We don't have to. Um, and then I will also present to council legislation that is kind of what I'll call placeholder. It is the compliance legislation 
that we can get before council in the ordinary course so we won't have to rely on emergency reading and then wait and see. So what I expect is you will have a first reading understanding that there's still you know, some ev evolution or some uh, uncertainty as what's going to happen based upon the, the status of the litigation and the intention of the trial judge to issue a decision on or before uh, February 28th. So it's just an effort to keep the ball rolling and and have council aware and the public aware of what's happening in as real a time as we can make it. Okay, thank you. Any questions? All right, well, um, look at that. We are exactly on time as we move into new business. And uh, we have one issue, which is to talk about our council retreat on uh, January 10th. That's a Wednesday from nine to noon. And um, so I want to thank Judy for putting together an initial draft reflecting some of the things that we've mentioned. And so I thought maybe we'd take a few minutes to kind of look at what's there and, and how we want to tweak this um, so that we can get this agenda out. And uh, as was emphasized before, as with all of our meetings, um, that is a public meeting um, uh, as opposed to an executive session. So. Uh, comments about the agenda um, I had I want to see a conversation really it could just be council together talking about our role uh, in village government um, I think it's a place where I mean uh, Karen in the article about Karen uh, which was really great in the bias news uh, that Diane wrote, she talked about how we function quite differently than most uh, city councils do, and we do. <laughs> we do very much so. And um, and I think it's really an interesting, I mean, I this is what's so interesting about democratic government. This is a really interesting conversation, and I think that it should just be about that first, because it's about our relationship. I mean, if you look at our organizational chart, which is the thing that really, it was almost hidden up there, but up at the top are the citizens. And we represent the citizens. That is our role. It's, you know, and then what's our relationship to, you know, the people that work directly for us, which is only a small handful of staff, which is the village manager, our clerk, you know, our um, village solicitor. Um, Oh, you work for the village, but you don't work for us directly. <laughs> uh, so you work under the, the uh, village manager. So it's just, I think it's a really important conversation to have, and I would ask that there be at least a half hour uh, that we devote to that. And like I said, it could just be the council itself. I don't think staff needs to be a part of that would be the way I would suggest it. But So that's... Uh, okay. And I think we should have the organizational chart there because it's. Yeah, and actually, um, I know Patty and, and the team have looked at the uh, org chart. So uh, so there are some uh, some updates that I, I think that's a great idea to add that. Um, Lisa, were you thinking about something? Well, I, I was just, I mean, it's on the agenda. I'm trying, you know, there's never enough time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and but, I do want to emphasize, I'm thinking about this really as a part one. Part one. Normally we do a full day uh, retreat, but I think what I love about this idea, and uh, both Judith and Marianne have mentioned it in prior meetings, is that it's going to give us an opportunity to tee up some things that we haven't done before early on. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of talk about goals, a little bit of talk about commission interests. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, what were you thinking? Well, I was just going to say, I, uh, f for me, I, I think the conversation about the role on commission and the stance and position of the council on commissions is an important conversation and somewhat related to our most recent conversation about you know relationships and that sort of thing as well Great. so I, I just don't know if that's enough time but <clears throat> okay thank you Kevin were any thoughts um, no I would just sort of echo uh, <laughs> I think Lisa's comments and I think the key is the fact that we're doing it in two parts mm -hmm. is I mean I think by definition we'll get into some things here and we'll be able to ex extend the conversation right. if we don't if there's not too much time Sure. And I mean, the other thing is, we won't make any decisions at mm -hmm. our retreat. You know, we will, we'll talk about our thoughts and our ideas, but, you know, those, that actual deliberation will happen at a, a regular meeting. Mm -hmm. 
Are we going to talk about goals at all? That's, yes. I, I'd ask Judy so to that bring was, the goals here, I, to, to that, put the goals in our... Yeah, yeah so I think we should add... Starting um, something about the goals. I yeah, I, I kind of just wrote a note, preliminary discussion of 2018 goals. Well, actually, what I would like to suggest is that we look at the 2017 goals <coughs> and talk about what was accomplished, what wasn't accomplished, mm -hmm. How did that work? And in preparation of doing the 2018 goals, and and then talk about how we want to work on the 2018 goals, because I do think it's good for citizens to be involved, have a chance to be involved, and that's something I'd like for us to talk about. How can we involve citizens more in our goals? How can we have, you know, just how can we be effective in our in our creating goals. And, and I, I know, you know, in talking about this before, because some communities have set up platforms to allow for uh, citizen participation, prioritizing things and giving feedback. Um, one thing I thought about today as I was walking to the meeting is Facebook now has set up a tool where you can do um, kind of like a survey. So. One simple thing we could do if we wanted to look at priorities is we could list you know, our suggested goals and, and people could basically prioritize them in, in a very simple way. So there are some things that we could do for free um, that, that could that. facilitate that, yeah. Um, and I can, I can even show, I can bring a computer and show that at the retreat, what mm. that looks like. Um, yes, yeah, so I definitely, I'm, I love that idea about 2017 goal review because certainly things are multi-year goals as well um, and it occurred to me that uh, I do want to make sure that with a uh, discussion of council rules that we also add interests uh, with boards and commissions so I think that's something we we'll want to talk about both of those things and um, I do think we can adjust some of these items so we might not be able to talk about them completely but we'll at least be able to get that initial conversation on those <coughs> topics. Mm -hmm. and, um, yep. As part of our <coughs> discussion about commissions I'd like to talk about how how commissions can be more effective and how we can have a discussion with commissions about that how, can, how we can have a stronger relationship with commissions because there's a tendency for commissions to just sort of be out there doing their own thing. And there's, I think there could be a better relationship between council and commissions, and I think commissions could be more effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other thoughts about the? Oh, and, and I, what, what I wrote, where, where we're talking about our relationship with staff and these, I'd like for us to talk about reports from the police department, the planner, and the mayor, and how those reports can be most effective for council. Okay. All right. So that, that definitely is starting to be a lot, but I think that, uh, <laughs> uh -oh. um, yeah, but. You know, I think, well, this will be good practice for us to sort of also think about, you know, if we give ourselves 20 minutes or 30 minutes for a topic, that we, we do our best to talk about that, and then we, you know, know that we've got a placeholder. Um, so I think it probably, yeah, Patty? I was just going to try to clarify that when you wanted staff there. Yeah. Then, yes. Because okay. I'm a little confused about that right now. But why doesn't... Brian, why don't you set, why don't you with this input set the agenda with Marianne maybe, or just, you know, okay. you guys want to do that? Finalize it and you can decide if the, I mean, I don't know how other people feel about that idea of us just chatting a bit as to what, it, what it is to be an elected representative. Not that staff don't have opinions about that, but it's just. <coughs> well, I feel Sorry. good about it, but I don't see any reason for staff not to be there. I mean, okay. generally, Judy mm -hmm. and, yeah. and and Melissa and Patty would be there. Mm -hmm. And Chris. And Chris. We'll have a party. I'm, I'm starting to feel that um, the time that's set aside is just not enough to do much of this justice at this mm -hmm. point. 
I don't know if we need to, I'm not suggesting that we curtail what we've talked about already, but can we start a little earlier? I know it's not, it's not in my best interest to start necessarily in the earlier, <laughs> but, um, but is there an issue with the room reservation? Uh, are we able to get in a little earlier? Or does that make sense? I mean, the time we have, three hours, is looking less and less feasible. Uh, the more we talk about it. That would be okay with me. Like maybe um, start at 8.30 and mm -hmm. go to 12.30. Add an hour. Okay. It's okay. Does that yeah. work for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could start at 8. Yeah, I could start at 8. Um, <laughs> Bring coffee. They start dropping off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I would. I can. can we start at 8 and yeah, try yeah. to end by yeah, 12? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I, you know, I actually... We can get a lot done in four hours, mm -hmm. but I think that's a great idea, Kevin. So, yeah. 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 Um, all right, so 8 to 12, we'll make sure there's plenty of coffee. All yeah. right. Um, great. Uh, any questions or comments? Yes, Diane. Diane Chittister, Yellow Springs News. Um, just a reminder that while the retreat is a public meeting, it tends to be out of the public eye. You, you don't, you're not on TV, you're not the regular time. And my understanding that it's to focus on process rather than issues. So, and you are largely doing that. But just um, when you start talking about goals, I hope you're careful not to be talking about issues that the public should be aware of. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And Thank thanks, Diane. I mean, it, my vision there is really that we just start, we put out priorities that you know we are thinking about um, a lot of which I think should have been in our campaign materials and that sort of thing but not digging into those and there will be minutes uh, from that retreat uh, actually so. I, I sort of disagree yeah I, I, I would rather focus on not on 2018 but on 2017 and looking at them more from a process point of view Hey, we did a, did a good job on this. Got done. Why? Hey, we didn't do such a good job on this. Half got done. Why? <laughs> so that when we go into 2018, we're we can be more effective, and and really just more use it as a way well to acquaint the new council with what we have been doing, mm -hmm. which I think is important, and bring it back. I mean, I, I, we will bring these. 2017 goes back to talk about at a council meeting what happened, what didn't happen, but, but uh, for strategy purpose more than than uh, for the project itself. Okay, that works for me. Okay. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Did you have someone, John? Okay. Um, all right. Well, then I believe we're moving into our reports, mm -hmm. and so uh, manager's report, right. Patty. Um, so, as I mentioned at uh, the previous meeting, we have revamped the special events policy here at the village. Uh, there were a few glitches over the last year, and we wanted to <laughs> try to revise that to help people um, avoid those glitches in their events. So we have redesigned the um, event permit, which is included in your packets. It's more definitive, has a little more information in it um, that's required. We've also revised the process internally. Um, your application has to be uh, in 30 days prior to the event so that we could review it. Excuse me, and make sure it gets through all of the departments that it needs to get through, and that way we can make sure you have electric if you need it, barricades, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are, you start with Samantha down in the youth center, Samantha Stewart, um, for any event. Um, and if you happen to go to Ruthann, which a lot of people do, we will certainly forward that on back down to Sam to go through the process. Um, but we hope that this process works out a little bit better for folks and they don't have as many glitches with their events. So we'll see how that goes for this year and, and see if we need to adjust it a little bit. Uh, can I just make two or mm -hmm. two maybe questions? Mm -hmm. So one is, uh, I know we had that issue about when do you pay or not pay? Yes. So do we have, have we put that in writing, what our policy is on that? Um, it is not in writing per se, but if it, if it, 
is of benefit to the general public and you are not charging mm -hmm. for it mm -hmm. or not accepting donations and I can get Sam to write it and clarify it I did ask her to write it but I haven't gotten it, gotten okay. it yet um, and she can clarify it for us okay um, but um, so if it's um, for instance um, the tree Academy that I attend um, it, through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources uh, they wanted to use our space, but they can't use our space because they charge for their events. So unless they want to pay to use our space, they can't use it. However, if you're hosting a public information session on um, tenants' rights and you're not charging and it's open to the public, then you don't get charged unless we have to call staff in on their day off, okay. which is a different, you know, Sundays there's no one here, or if you do it prior to the staff coming in um, downstairs in the youth center because they normally hand, handle the events here at the Bryan Center. Okay. So there are a couple of exceptions to that um, and I will ask Sam to clarify that or maybe Melissa if you could ask Sam since she reports to you now um, and we can get that and bring that back. Okay, yeah I'd like to see that. And the second thing is I, I, I'd like some clarity on um, I guess when there are opportunities for the village to sponsor someone. For example, I was thinking about last year with Blues Fest, mm -hmm. um, well, actually two years ago, and there was a little bit of confusion because of that disconnect. So I guess I'd like to contemplate in the process if we are rec that request comes to council, how we interface with the village process. Well, Does that make sense? What would normally happen <clears throat> there is that um, the request would go to Judy as it's a request for council sponsorship essentially and then if it's approved by council I can forward that down to Sam and say it's approved by council we have to do some there are budget line changes because it would come out of council's budget to go into whatever budget needs to be supported for that event okay um, so it would still start with Judy because that's where it should start and then um, we can get it through the process from there. Okay. So maybe if we think about articulating that along with this sort of what the, you know, how the fees work. Okay. That would be good. Is, are, is the space, I mean, I know in the past, and maybe it's still happening, um, people would have their children's parties here and it was very reasonable if you lived in the village. Um, the fees were quite reasonable. Is that still going? Is that still available for people? Okay, it yeah. is. That hasn't really you changed. Live in the village, yes. It's okay. Um, I have a couple things. One is, it seems like there could be small events that are people might not even know 30 days ahead of time mm -hmm. that they want to do it. If there's space, is there some reason why it can't rent A and B for? It for is no. There's actually uh, we did change it from can't that it will not be approved to that it may not be approved for specifically that reason. Um, so it, if you read the um, the form, it says may not be approved. Um, may not be considered oh, for approval. Oh, okay, I see that. But, yeah, but I we, had, we, we kind of left that because there may be someone who says, oh my gosh, I forgot to schedule my kid's birthday party. Okay, um, yeah, I had, I, yeah. for some reason I hadn't seen this. Um, the other uh, thing that is related but not exactly the same is maybe a year ago or sometime last year, staff worked on events that regularly happen uh -huh. in the village with I think some suggestions of the village charging for those events. That's correct. And that was sort of tabled. I would like to bring that back. Okay. And now we can decide when we want to do that, but I think that it I I think that it makes sense when the village puts out a lot of in kind effort that we consider charging for that. So you want that added to the agenda for a topic, future topic? For a or? future topic, yes. Okay. So. And I think these things are connected, you know, because, you know, again, I remember with the Blues Fest thing, <laughs> because council didn't really understand, I guess, the, the village process. Mm -hmm. um, there was that disconnect. So 
so if we can kind well, of that's, it all yeah out. it's kind of more of a uh, it's that's more of a budgetary thing where if they request it from council then it has to be moved from the council's budget line to the say the electric or the public works or whatever department needs that to support that through man hours right um, so that was I think the glitch there was trying to figure that out and I think the other thing is us knowing that there's a process to go through right so yeah and there there is and it is a separate process where if you're requesting a, spo a council sponsorship they start with Judy Judy forwards it to me I you know do my thing with it give it back to Judy and she brings it to council okay so all right um, the Planning and Zoning Office, um, the, the position that Denise occupies is technically a full-time position. Um, however, when Denise went into that position, I think it was two years ago now, um, we thought that she could handle it at 30 hours a week and for a long time we went around just, we went along just fine with 30 hours a week. But we have been so incredibly busy for the last year that she's putting in anywhere between 33 and 36 hours a week anyway. Um, and looking forward to 2018, um, we're going to be working on complete streets, active transportation, there's going to be a review of the comprehensive plan, we may talk about sidewalks, there are pocket neighborhood developments coming in. Um, so um, it just makes sense to make her full time. Um, so we're going to be moving Denise to full time and the date for that is uh, January 22nd. So as of January 22nd, um, Denise will be there full time. Her hours will likely be 8 to 4, although we haven't firmed that up yet. Right now she works 9 to 3. Um, so we will put out a press release about that when we get the hours figured out, but I just wanted to give council the heads up um, that that was coming. And um, we are still working on the small cell tower uh, legislation. There's, there have been a couple of developments in that where they're reconsidering some of the provisions of that bill at the state level. So we're kind of working in the dark right now to make our revisions and we will bring that back to council um, as soon as we can. And yes. I, I, I'm, I apologize. I had intended to say something at the beginning of the meeting about an update with the housing needs assessment and I forgot to do that okay. and, and I would like to do it and have just have a side conversation with you as we're doing it okay um, so what, what I'd like to say first is that uh, we did receive the housing needs assessment it's 428 pages <laughs> yeah. however it's the first 50 or so pages that have the sort of meat of it and the last hundred or so are a lot of data. Um, I have read it. You've finished it. I've, I've gotten 129 okay. pages. Well, I've read all, well, I didn't read all of the house sales from the Dayton metro area, which is about 20 pages, mm -hmm. but I read everything else. Um, and I feel very good about it. And even though it's a draft, there may be some tweaks, I think. I, I would like to let it have, just have it sent to all the council members um, so that you can start reading it because if we wait until the presentation or the next packet comes out, yeah. you're gonna have a lot to read. Sounds like we need a head start. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very well put together. Mm -hmm. So you read, you can figure, pretty much figure mm -hmm. out the part that's going to tell, tell you, you know, what we need to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and, and the only thing I'm worried about there, Marianne, is that then the draft is out there and if we make certain tweaks then, you know, because part of what I've read, I've caught some things in it that I think need to be revisited for accuracy um, before, you know, it, the final version is out. So that, that would be the, the only thing I'm concerned about. For, for instance, the number of accessory dwelling units and the number of lot splits and things, those, those just aren't in, in my mind accurate so that would be my concern with doing that. Well, is there a problem of releasing a draft with understanding that there may be some tweaks? Well and, and Patty do you mind annotating the things you've caught and just sending that to us? Yeah, or? That, that would be <laughs> sorry. That, that would be pretty difficult to okay. do over 429 pages. Understood. Um, but I mean if, if council wants the draft it's you know. <coughs> well how about, because um, I, I think I would like to have that advance as well, um, how about just when you send it out in the cover email, just 
sort of an overview of things mm -hmm. that may need some adjusting that you've noticed. Okay. I can do that. Good idea. Yeah. Okay. And before we move too far, back on the, uh, there was just a little minor thing I found on the, the event permit application, uh -huh. really minor, in the um, insurance information, uh, when it says the following language must be on the certificate, the second line down from there, just a comma missing after employees. Okay, got you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Patty? Oh, uh, no, that's it. Okay, uh, Melissa? Okay, the only big thing that I have, um, or notable thing, is that uh, starting today, the utility billing window um, and office will be open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Um, so we've expanded hours. This is the second time I've expanded hours since I've gotten here. It was 10 to 2 when I first started, and then we expanded it uh, to 8 to 3, and now we're going to do, um, or keep the window open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. So we will no longer... Um, keep the window open until 6 on the 15th because um, I've had the chance to work many a uh, 15th of the month and after 5 p.m. there's nobody that comes. So um, if we expand the windows throughout the whole entire week then we figure that um, that gives people lots of ample opportunity. Plus we still have the um, drop box in the hallway next to the window. We also have the drive up box out front and then we also take uh, payments uh, over the phone and um, online, so there's plenty of options. Great. So that's well, it. And I know that uh, that announcement was well received, mm -hmm. so it's great that we're doing that. Yep. Thanks. And would that be like posted on Facebook? And... Already done. Oh, thanks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we got lots of likes too. <laughs> Excellent. So, yes. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Judy. Unless that's the chief trust. All right. Well, are, are you ready, uh, Chief Carlson? Yes. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. What were we talking about? <laughs> How great New Year's you. was. <laughs> it was great, uh, except for the cold. Um, happy to report that we have um, tested nine applicants for two officer positions. Six have passed. We'll be conducting the second phase of interviews next week. Excited about that. And um, we have promoted two officers to the position of corporal. Officer David Meister, Officer Jeffrey Bean. I think they'll both be uh, excellent as supervisors on shift. They'll be going through the FTO process and we're very excited about the change. Great. Great. <laughs> Any questions? Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Could I make an announcement real quick? I just got a uh, text from Johnny Burns uh, that there is a power outage uh, around Walnut and Railroad Street. So if you are in the area of Walnut and Railroad Street and your power is out, the crews are working on it. Okay. Thanks, Patty. Okay. Thanks, Johnny and crew. Uh, Judy. I Well, I submitted to you sort of a year-end totals uh, just so you kind of can get an overview of what all went on at, during the, the year for council. I don't feel the need to go over it. It's just sort of for your entertainment. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I think that brings us to uh, thinking about our future agenda items. and. Um, so uh, it sounds like the action item for January 10th is that Marianne and I will get together in the next couple days, uh, update the draft, and have Judy get that out to everybody. Um, the draft rules and procedures is that, or what are you? Uh, well, I was talking about the council retreat actually oh, for January 10th, um, and then on January 16th, so we have our housing needs assessment. Um, Marianne, how long do you think that we should allow for that discussion, special report? An hour. Okay. Um, so we will be uh, doing our uh, assignments for boards and commissions. Um, we've got a the voluntary tax collection discussion, which is M Melissa. You'll be doing mm -hmm. that. Um, how long do you think that item will be? What is that? Yeah. Um, Judith, that was the voluntary tax collection agreements. The Airbnb oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. agreement. 
Okay. I would say I've got some materials. How long do you think? <coughs> well, I'll just the whole discussion might take. Brian's asking. Maybe oh. 15 minutes. I th I think that that's enough. Okay. Why is it called voluntary? Uh, <laughs> because the agreement is something. Logic. No, the it's an agreement. It's a voluntary agreement. So it's an agreement that exists that we could enter into. If we so it. choose, with Airbnb specifically, oh, there may be some others. Yes. Okay. So yeah, it's okay. not an agreement. That, okay, it's not yeah. about the. Okay. No, it's not about the tax being voluntary. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think the revolving loan follow, fund follow-up will be fairly brief. I know that uh, Melissa and Chris are working on that. Um, I have a comment because that came up at our last uh, council meeting, where Chris suggested that we start that we develop a community improvement corporation, a designated community improvement corporation. I, on the face of it, I don't necessarily have anything against a designated community improvement corporation, but it's a huge deal. And if it's something we're going to think about, I want to have something in writing mm -hmm. ahead of time. And I was trying to remember who did that research. Was it you and Jerry? We had a couple years ago something that, no, some I document. Didn't. It was not me and Jerry, but when, when Community Resources was originally started in 1998 or whenever it was, there was a discussion at the time, should it be a designated CIC? It was decided not to be a designated CIC because it was thought that it enables the village government to get into economic development in a way that a lot of people at that point thought probably most people didn't want the village government to do. It is a, a quasi-public body. And, um, if, and it feels very weird to me to think of starting one just as community resources lend, laid itself down. So I just think if, we're, if we want to do that, we need to really have, uh, we need to have a really good discussion and very much public input. Sure. Is that community investment? Community Improvement Corporation. Corporation. Okay. And the, the county has one, um, which I guess, well, I don't know that we, anyway, Dayton has, I mean, you know, there are common things. It's a standard. They're a common thing now, but it is a big deal, and there's a lot of history, you know, about community resources, and they got raked all over the coals, and so I think we it behooves us to think very carefully if, it, if we think we want right. to do it. Well, what I thought we should have in the packet for this discussion is, I know that we were presented with some documentation about mm -hmm. what a designated CIC mm -hmm. means, um, but I do agree that if we move in that direction, it would need to be a bigger topic. So I'm thinking, though, for our next meeting that we can get that information. Um, Maybe Judy can find it. Define what I know we had some kind of one or two pager about designated CICs. Um, and, Probably uh, Karen and Jerry. May, yeah, question. maybe Karen and Jerry. Judy did a quick check after we spoke to uh -huh. Brian about it. And, I've not uh, found anything. Okay, I'll, I'll look in my files too then. Um, okay, and then we've got uh, 2018 goals discussion, which I think will be uh, a, a more meaty one. And um, I, I think we probably need to add a retreat update based on what we talked about on the 10th. Uh, any other items <laughs> that we want to try to fit did, in for the 16th? Did you want the resolution regarding the taser policy brought? Yes. Okay, and obviously and this is getting I, really full, yeah. Yeah. And then I wasn't clear as to whether you just wanted a draft, re, revised draft of the rules and procedures document or whether you actually wanted legislation. Yes, both. Um, and. I, you and I maybe can work on that based on the comments and discussion from tonight. And, and uh, is that a, that's a retreat topic or no? I'm sorry, no. I kind of dropped off the No, I think that's just a topic for the 16th. Okay. And so yep. we'll, we'll revise it and have legislation and, and see if we're ready to okay. approve those. Got it. Um, I, you know, uh, in terms of this agenda, the voluntary agreement and the revolving loan fund, do we have to have it at this meeting? This sounds like a big meeting already without them, okay, without so those two. I don't let's think potentially we're move it. those forward. Because okay. the goals is if we're going to do anything beyond a very cursory look yeah. at goals and this huge report we're getting on housing needs assessment, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. It's a lot already, so I would just take those off. They can be delayed to the and, next day. And I'm sorry, you said both the voluntary tax and the revolving loan mm -hmm. fund? Yeah. February? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably. They both just that seem great. And then I did have a question for Chris regarding you, you had mentioned a first reading of the preliminary stall tactics for House Bill 49. I'm paraphrasing, but is that the <laughs> legislation you wanted? Yeah. There, I expect there will be two pieces on there. The first is the, the actual changes to the ordinances that we want to adopt for housekeeping. And then it will be first read for substantive changes so the council can kind of see what's living out there. Um, I do not anticipate that, that we don't even have to do first read. I mean, I, again, this is evolving. It could be that I just submit the information that's in the packet so you've seen it. And there may not be any reason for a public discussion. I would just include it with a brief solicitor's report. If that, that's evolving. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, good. So it seems like we'll have a, a very healthy uh, agenda. We're looking forward to the retreat. Uh, Jonathan, I did see your hand up, but we don't usually take comments during the uh, agenda. But if you have something to talk about afterwards, I, I would be happy to stick around. Um, so uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone. So it can be done. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a real moment, guys.